welcome Sesame Street Workshop to our conference as our lead-off keynote this morning. And uh, how can we not be happy and cheerful? Well, actually, it may not be morning everywhere, uh, obviously. But how can we not be cheerful by with, with looking at this lovely Muppet in front of us with a hat, I guess. Anyway, I'm very excited to have June Lee and Louise Maris, uh, Maris, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, um, here for the conference. And we're excited to hear about your research. And Gail, I'll let you moderate, but I just want to introduce um, our esteemed guests. And this session will be recorded and archived for posterity. The link will be available about a half an hour after um, the, the session has stopped recording. And, um, and you'll be able to access it on our Quick Links page. Before we start, I just want to give some special thanks to our uh, sponsors, I Earn USA, Brain Pop, Flat Classroom Project, Little Lives, Big Dreams, TechSmith, and of course, Blackboard Collaborate. So thank you again to our sponsors for making everything happen this week. It's been an amazing week. The next activity we're going to do is I'm going to um, give you all whiteboard privileges. And this is something that we do, uh, June and Louise, uh, with every session. Uh, we take the whiteboard uh, pointer tool, which looks like a star, and we click on that. You may have to click twice. Uh huh. And indicate where you are in the world of today. So it looks like we've got a couple okay. U.S. people, somebody in Europe. And you can also type in uh, where you're from in the chat so that people can see your exact location. I'm in Chicago in the middle of the United States. And I'm, assume, uh, I'm sure Louise is probably in Wisconsin and June is in New York. All right. So we're definitely spanning the U.S. here today. Um, I'm particularly excited to welcome Sesame Street because last year I had the opportunity to hear one of their colleagues speak in a conference in the Middle East. And I'm not sure, you can hear my, co you can hear my cat howling in the background <laughs> right now. Um, and I'm not sure if everybody's aware of the tremendous um, work that they do outside of the U.S. in addition to their programming here. So I think this is going to be a very enlightening, enlightening session, and we're happy to have you here, June Louise. So over to you. Thanks very much, Lucy. Um, this is June speaking, and very excited to be here. Um, this is my first time participating on a virtual conference. I think it's all very cool, and um, really happy to meet everybody online. Louise, did you want to introduce yourself really quickly? Sure, I'm Louise. Uh, I'm in the Netherlands right now on sabbatical. Um, and it's my first time too, and I think it's absolutely wonderful. So I look forward to talking to you all. OK? Great. So I'm going to start off um, by providing a little bit of an overview of Sesame Workshops International projects and talk a little bit about how we engage in them. And then um, Louise is going to take over and present some findings from a meta-analysis that she had done looking at our impact internationally across a range of studies. Um, so onward. Oops, I think we're still on the first slide. Sorry, let me click through. OK. So back in its, in its inception in 1969, um, Sesame Workshop's mission has always been to how harness the power of media. In that, in that case, back in 1969, was television um, to help children reach their highest potential. And the founders envisioned Sesame Street as a means of closing the gap in school readiness between children who are more advantaged and children who are less advantaged. And this mission continues um, at Sesame Workshop to this day, um, both domestically and internationally. But in many ways, it's much broader now. Um, Internationally, especially, we don't only address school readiness, but we also address many other important aspects of children's development. 
We call ourselves the longest street in the world. Um, Sesame Street appears in some form in over 140 countries at last count. And often it's simply the US version of the show that most of you are familiar with, you know, dubbed in a local language or even not dubbed at all. Um, but in about 30 of these countries, Sesame Street takes the form of what we call co-productions. And a co-production is a localized, locally produced version of Sesame Street um, that is designed to meet the educational needs um, of that country specifically. And I'll describe this in a little bit more um, detail um, later on in the talk. But I can talk a little bit right now about um, what we call the Sesame Workshop model. And this is the model that we engage in, in throughout all of our content creation process. It's a model that you know, was developed when we first started in 1969. It continues to be used today, even though we're not the only ones that use it. Um, it's very prevalent in the ed ed entertainment education um, community, and as well as in other um, children media producers. Um, and the, the, the heart of um, the Sesame Workshop model is really you know, a collaboration among production, um, content, and research. And the production um, consists of producers and writers, and they really focus on the creative elements of the show, you know, making sure that the content we create is engaging, it's appealing, it's true to who our Muppets are. Um, and then on the content side, we have educational content specialists that work with the production team very closely to um, ensure the educational integrity of the content that is to make sure that um, the content is age appropriate, it's culturally appropriate, and all of the educational messages are really clear. And then the last part, and not the least, certainly, is research. Um, you might have heard that Sesame Workshop um, engages in a lot of testing for its uh, content during the content creation process. And this is an opportunity to bring the children's voice into this process. Um, we take the materials that are in development and we go out and test them with a target audience. Typically that's children, um, sometimes it's parents and teachers, and we want to make sure that what we've produced is really comprehensible, it is engaging, it's entertaining, it's educational. And all that research gets brought back to the production team and the content team, and you know, we, that allows us to do you know, any mid-course corrections and, and changes to the content while they're in development so that you know, what we put out on air and in distribution is, is the best content that it can be. And I think each, each person brings something you know, very unique to the table. And I think at the end of the day, it enables us to create content that um, no one individual party can do on their own. So this is an illustration of our process. And so we engage in a very similar process. Um, across the world and domestically. And it always starts with an assessment of need. Um, we want to be where we are needed, where a Sesame Street project can make a difference. Um, we also want to be where we're welcome and where we can build a broad base of support. Um, so typically, when we begin a project, you know, we do um, either a formal or an informal um, feasibility assessment to make sure that um, a Sesame Street project can be um, feasible in the country, um, that there is a need, and that there is um, support in the education community, in government ministries, um, and that there is capacity um, in country um, to produce a show like Sesame Street. And then, after we determine the feasibility of um, a project, it always kicks off with what we call a curriculum seminar or a content seminar. And this is where we gather advisors from around the world, well, not from around the world, from around the country um, in a range of um, expertise. Um, so we could get you know, pe people who are experts in child health, in education, in literacy, um, you know, kind of everything under the sun, the arts, um, theater, um, children's writers, um, and we convene them and we talk about what they think 
from their perspective, is the most critical educational needs that could be well served by a media project like Sesame Street. And through this discussion, um, which sometimes is very, you know, it can get contentious, it can, it's very hard won, we, we kind of built consensus around what are the educational objectives that this project should be about. And from that point, from that curriculum seminar, comes um, a statement of educational objectives, or what we call the curriculum for the project. Um, and it's not a curriculum in a, in a sense of a, like a scope and sequence curriculum that you would see in a classroom, but rather it is a, a set of educational objectives. And every single piece of content that's created addresses at least one educational objective in this curriculum. Once the educational objectives are set, they become sort of the backbone of the project. Um, from then on, we move into production, and whether that's script writing or you know creating print materials. And it's during this production process is where that three circles um, model that I had shown before comes in. This, uh, I'm trying to click back to it, but it's not going. Yeah, those three circles. That is where it comes into play is during this production process. Um, so researchers, content specialists, and producers work together um, to develop the content. Once that's done and finalized, it goes into distribution, whether it's through broadcast television or radio or through print materials to the community. And after that, where possible, um, we try to do a summative evaluation of the work. Um, and this allows us to evaluate you know, the strengths and weaknesses, the successes, the gains in learning um, on the children's part or on the part of teachers or parents where appropriate. And that really helps us to figure out you know, where we've done particularly well in and where we might, um, there might be some room for improvement. Um, and then sort of the whole cycle kind of starts again. So it's, it's always iterative. It's a multi-layered process. Um, but this kind of pretty much captures the process that we engage in. Um, on all of our projects. And our projects internationally is really informed by and supports um, the UN development goals, in particular, um, you know, universal primary education. All of our work is in early childhood education, which kind of feeds into primary education, um, promoting gender equity. Um, combating um, particular diseases like HIV and AIDS and malaria. And as almost more recently, um, both in the US and internationally, several of our projects have focused on environmental awareness and kind of starting young and, and developing that kind of sensibility in young children. Um, so I think we're starting to look at environment as well as a, as a critical piece um, of the work that we do. And I think meeting local educational needs is really at the heart of what we do. Um, you can imagine that the educational needs of a child in Egypt, for instance, is it's very different from um, the needs of a child in Northern Ireland. Um, they live in very different cultural contexts, you know, socio-political contexts. So in Egypt, for instance, our focus has been on girls' education, on basic skills, and on health. And in Northern Ireland, um, where the country has been involved in you know, pretty long-term conflict, um, a lot of the content that we create focuses on mutual respect and understanding. And as I had said, you know, our local work is really, our international work is really locally created. I had mentioned already that local experts create um, the curriculum. And and the production teams also you know, create localized um, versions of everything you can think of, from sets to Muppets to um, you know, different forms of media. And the local sets really reflect the environment of the country, whether it's a plaza in Mexico or in Bangladesh. Um, the show is set in a village with a banyan tree. Um, and all of the Muppets are. Um, very much local. Uh, on this slide here, you can see Cami um, at the bottom, who's from South Africa. And then this is Googly um, in blue, who's from India. Um, 
also talk a little bit more about the Muppets. But they really reflect the sensibilities and unique qualities um, of the country oftentimes. Um, so for example, um, in Indonesia, um, two of our Muppets um, feature you, you know, animals that are really unique to Indonesia. We have a one-horned rhinoceros who's, ba who's a baby, and he's a little bit grouchy. And then we have Tantan, who is an orangutan. Um, and in South Africa, we have a meerkat named Moshi. Um, and it's also really important to embody um, you know, really childlike and fun qualities in the Muppets as well. And I think that's true of all of the Sesame Workshop um, projects that we engage in. Um, all of the production is done in the local language, sometimes in multiple local languages where, um, where appropriate. Uh, for instance, in South Africa, I think there are 11 official languages. So the f show features, I think, four to five um, local languages. And the Muppets oftentimes, um, in a dialogue, would switch back and forth, um, as you would do sort of naturally, um, this code switching, um, but with, without being confusing to the child audience. And then um, we certainly use multiple media um, in our international work because we want to reach children where they are, whether it means reaching them through um, TV, radio, um, online, digital media, or other means. And speaking a little bit more about Muppets, um, oftentimes when we create characters around the show, um, we pretty intentionally design them to um, be able to avail ourselves to specific um, educational lessons. So for instance, um, in Egypt, we have a Hoha um, who um, embodies really a strong girl character. Um, and that really helps to support the girl's education focus that we have in Egypt. So we have lots of um, segments with her singing, singing about what she wants to be when she grows up. Maybe she could be a lawyer or an astronaut. Um, and we also have very strong you know, girl characters, um, Tuktuki in Bangladesh and Chamki in India. And Chamki, you'll notice, is um, very deliberately dressed in school uniform. And that is really to punctuate you know, the lessons around girls' education. Um, in France, um, they have a focus on children with disabilities. So we have a special Muppet named Griot, who is in a wheelchair. Um, and Oscar, uh, many of us are um, familiar with. He's a grouch, but he actually, um, it, you know, presents contrary viewpoints, and it really helps, you know, children take different perspectives. And Cami, who's um, a mother in South Africa, who is HIV positive, um, and that really helps to support the lessons around HIV and AIDS and destigmatization. And you know, Sesame Street is probably best known for television, but around the world, we really work across different levels of technology and different levels of reach. Um, and very often, we actually work at the community level um, with teachers, schools, child care centers, community centers. And we offer content in the form of you know, mostly print materials, sometimes audiovisual materials, that really help to support what these schools and communities are doing. And this just shows you some of the um, some of the alternative ways we get our content out, um, other than through television. So, for instance, right over here, you have what we call the story pond, which is a piece of material we created. It's a big vinyl mat with lots of icons on it. It was deliberately created to not be very text heavy. Um, and you know, it's it's something that our team in India had come up with to support children's storytelling skills, narrative skills, um, and um, vocabulary. And that's you know really gone over very well. And we're actually starting to adapt that particular piece of material for lots of projects around the world. And uh, here is an example of community viewing. Um, lots of times um, in. Uh, Parts of the countries that we work in, electricity is not particularly stable or accessible. Um, so a lot of kids don't have very frequent opportunities to watch the show. Um, so what we've done in Bangladesh, we also do this in India, is to outfit um, 
rickshaw vans, little rickshaw vans um, with a television and kind of take that out to communities that might otherwise not be able to watch the show. Um, and we do this on a, on a pretty regular basis. And um, we also train um, the facilitator, the, the, actually the, the driver of the rickshaw, who's usually a man. Um, we also train them to help to facilitate the viewing experience by pausing the episode and asking questions during and at the end so that for the child it becomes a little bit more interactive and a little bit more um, meaningful uh, of, a, of a viewing experience. So at the end of the day, are we really making a difference in all this work that we're doing? Um, we've commissioned um, many, many, many summative evaluations to third party vendors. And we've ac accumulated a, a very nice body of studies that really document the educational impact of our crow productions in a range of content areas. So um, in literacy and math, um, in studies from Bangladesh, India, Mexico, Russia, um, we've seen gains um, as a result of, of exposure to Sesame. Street um, in mutual and promoting mutual respect and understanding in especially in regions that um, particularly it's a it's a real focus um, for our projects like Kosovo and Israel and Palestine and in in areas where we have a special focus on health like in Egypt South Africa um, Tanzania um, we found also that exposure is related to gains in knowledge about HIV AIDS, about malaria, um, transmission and prevention. So um, ending on that note is for, for my part of the presentation is pretty appropriate because I'm going to pass it along to Louise who's going to talk a little bit more about the body of research that she's examined um, for Sesame Street. Thanks, Jane. That was great. Um, can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. You can use your little icons, my icons, if you can hear OK. Um, yep, OK. All right. Um, now, I've noticed that my internet access seems to drop in and out occasionally. So if I vanish, don't panic. I think I come back in a few seconds. Um, so <laughs> I'm Louise Norris. I'm an associate professor at UW-Madison. and. Um, a colleague of mine and I were asked by Sesame Street to do a research project. And I want to talk a little bit about it um, today, all right? And then we'll definitely have time for questions at the end. Um, so as June mentioned, there were all these great research projects that were done uh, in different countries to assess uh, the international co-productions. But there were still some questions that kind of remained that we could be useful for. Uh, and so one, of course, is when you look across all the studies, was there evidence that watching Sesame Street taught kids things and taught them the sort of things that Sesame Street was designed to teach? Um, so some studies find big effects and some find smaller. But what do we find sort of across the studies? Um, another relevant question is whether the sort of positive effects that have been documented in the US are also occurring in other regions of the world, particularly in low-income regions. Um, and then, as a sort of contextual question, how the impact of watching Sesame Street would compare with that of other early childhood interventions, um, particularly given that we're often talking about um, you know, trying to figure out where resources should go. It's a really interesting question how television viewing um, might compare to other very labor intensive or resource intensive uh, initiatives. OK, am I making sense to you? But who means, like, tell me to slow down. You've got this little icon that says slow down uh, or whatever. Um, so in order to answer this question, we were asked to do a meta-analysis. And I want to take a second to kind of explain a tiny bit what a meta-analysis is without going into horrible amounts of detail. Um, so the idea of a meta-analysis is that it is kind of a statistical study of studies. Um, that what you do is you take the results of different research projects. And we didn't do any of those research projects. These were ones commissioned by Sesame Street. Um, and you combine um, the information that was gathered in them. So looking across sample sizes, looking across methodologies, you do this sort of systematic uh, searching for studies that are relevant and then systematic combination of them, taking the numerical information and reanalyzing it. Okay? And so you need this a clearly defined question, and our question was about the effects of 
stuff in the street. You need there to have been a bunch of studies that have statistical information, and there were. And you need a way of kind of thinking through, you know, here are the different outcomes that are being studied. Um, how can we combine them and make a sort of coherent description of what's going on? Um, so our role in this, mine and, and uh, Pam's, was as kind of independent and nonpartisan researchers, which you know was something of a struggle because I love that in the street and I grew up with it in Australia. Um, but uh, we were here as academics, and Sesame Street explicitly said, or Sesame Workshop said, that we had the freedom to publish results no matter what we found. Uh, good news or bad news or mixed news, um, we could sort of let the chips fall where they may. So I'm going to tell you <laughs> where the chips fell uh, today. Um, but the first I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we did, then I'll tell you about what we found, and then we'll talk about the context uh, of that. Um, so we focused on the research that looked at the international versions of Sesame Street rather than looking at research here in the United States. Um, and we decided we would look only at studies that looked at the effects of Sesame Street as it was broadcast. So not experiments uh, tweaking different versions of it, um, but really what's the effect of watching it as it's aired. And that we would look at the effects on key learning outcomes rather than things like attention. Um, and so I'll explain in a second what the learning outcomes were. Okay? Still making sense? You guys doing okay out there? Yep. All right. Let me know. Uh, okay. Good. Um, so the first task was finding the research. And uh, we were given a huge stack of studies by Sesame Street. Um, um, why focus on these outcomes rather than others? I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. I, absolutely. Um, and uh, but we also had to look at whether there was any other research out there that wasn't um, commissioned by Sesame Street that would be done independently. And so we spent a long time searching through multiple online databases for any research that was out there that would be about international co-productions rather than domestic, um, and that would look at some of those key learning outcomes and would have the right sort of data. Um, so that was part of it, was just finding the right studies. Um, and then we had to read through all the studies and think about how to combine them. There are many, many different measures, many different questions that have been asked of children around the world as, as a result of watching. And we had to decide how we could lump these together to be able to sort of come up with an overall answer. And we went back and we looked at what the goals were way back at the very beginning um, the goals for the very first season of Sesame Street when it was first being developed in the United States. And what we found that was very touching was that many of these, that all of these goals were still in play today, really, and that it sort of became this framework for us thinking about um, what the learning outcomes were. Um, and so in the end, we decided, to, I'm going to see if I can use my little pointer tool here. Um, um, we decided that we would um, point to ah, see. Uh, combine these two here, symbolic representations of cognitive processes as one chunk that fit with um, current uh, thinking about sort of school readiness. So this would be things like did kids learn letters and numbers, did they know shapes and colors, could they organize things in, in size, uh, could they solve um, sort of simple problems reasoning. Um, a second type of outcome uh, had to do with their learning of other types of materials, so a lot about the environment and science, about recycling, about health and safety issues, um, and also about uh, their cultural background, um, which we could include not so much a physical environment, but a sort of man-made environment. And then the last type of outcome um, really looked at um, children's understanding and learning about the social world. Um, so their pro-social reasoning, their attitudes towards social outputs, whether those are religious outputs or ethnic outputs, uh, how uh, their attitudes and opinions about gender roles, and so on. Okay, so we have these sort of three big chunks of sort of learning of letters, numbers, and reasoning. Um, physical and, and the cultural environment, and then pro-social reasoning and, and social attitudes. Um, so we coded 
uh, each of these studies uh, on a wide variety of variables. And basically, each line in our data set was compared on one outcome uh, for one set of kids in one study. Um, so here's the big thing. Was there an effect of Sesame Street across different countries, all the different countries, across all the different methods that we use, and across all the different learning outcomes? And the answer was yes, there was. Um, there was a statistically significant effect, and it was a positive effect. And so what I want to do now is talk a little bit more about how big an effect uh, and in what areas it was strong. Um, so there are lots of different ways of thinking about effects uh, or measuring effects. Um, and I'm just going to sort of walk through. For those of you who enjoy thinking about effect sizes, uh, it was an effect size of 0.26. But in, in more sort of everyday terms, what that means is it can be translated into a kind of a gain of 10 percentile points. Um, so that if we were to think of there being one group of kids who didn't watch Sesame Street and one group of kids who did uh, or who watched substantially more, then we would sort of think about it being a difference of 10 percentile points uh, across all the different learning outcomes. And so you could say, oh, students who were scoring at the 50th percentile could be predicted to now score at the 60th percentile after they'd watched Sesame Street when we sort of average across all the different studies that we looked at. Um, another way uh, I, I try to sort of illustrate it is to uh, do like a picture of little kids getting ready for kindergarten here. So like this little icon is supposed to be of a little kid with a backpack on marching off enthusiastically to school. Um, and we can sort of think of there being two parallel classes, one group of 25 kids that um, would have got Sesame Street and seen Sesame Street, um, and another group of 25 kids that we would think of as the control group that did not see Sesame Street. And if you were to sort of measure them and compare their performance, um, you would see, you see a couple of things. One is a lot of overlap still, right? It's not that the kids who got Sesame Street are now way higher, you know, and, and there's no overlap. There's still a lot of overlap, but that the group that got set in the street kind of got moved up. They're doing better. And but the kid who's in the very middle here in Sesame Street is performing at a level um, of one of the some higher performing kids who didn't get Sesame Street. So we can sort of see this shift um, that was associated with watching Sesame Street. Does that make sense for you guys? Uh, by all means, sort of uh, tell me if it's not making sense to you. OK, cool. All right, great. Um, so did the effects vary by learning outcomes, which was a really interesting question for us in particular. Um, and here I've broken it down. We, we had it chopped down by many different ways. Um, but here I've broken down by the, the big three. Um, and if we looked at cognitive skills, and under cognitive skills, that was letters and numbers, as well as shapes, colors, sorting, and so on, you could see um, really um, the effect size of about 0.27, which is about the sort of size that I was illustrating just now. Um, so learning about other things, like about health and safety, about the environment, uh, about science, and also about their own culture, um, there was a slightly bigger effect, also positive. And then the last one, which is this one here of social attitudes, um, there was still a positive effect, and it was still significantly aggregated across all the different outcomes, but it was somewhat smaller. It, it, it's harder to change um, or to improve children's attitudes towards a group uh, that they may have had many, many other you know, uh, social encounters with, other messages about that group. Um, um, and also just to change children's sort of social schemas or attitudes in general is a difficult task. So there was an effect um, not as big as this effect on teaching things like um, coral reefs or the importance of recycling. OK. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about, and then I want to leave it open to questions, is to think about how the results of these, uh, of this meta-analysis, and how the results of all that different research that was done in all those different countries, uh, with many, many children involved, 
how those results compare to other interventions that ha have been um, conducted around the world. And luckily for us, uh, we found a meta-analysis of the same sort of thing um, conducted by two other researchers, Flores and Barnett, um, published in 2010, which looked at other interventions in non-US countries. Um, now, their interventions were nothing to do with the media. Um, these were all interventions that were designed uh, for early childhood, for kids uh, who hadn't yet gone to elementary school, and that were designed to improve cognitive and health outcomes. And they compared three different types of things. Uh, first, just what is the effect of giving parents money so that they could afford to buy better food, maybe buy books, maybe afford to send their kids to, uh, to preschool or to buy them toys. Um, they compared the effects of giving children nutritional supplements, um, so better food, which uh, would have an impact right, on their physical and, and um, uh, physiological development. And then they compared other interventions which involved uh, either the kids going to preschool or uh, having someone come to the house and train the parents how to uh, provide cognitive enrichment. Or they looked also at interventions where the kids got food supplements and education. And so they were looking at how, how effective are these interventions. Um, and what I want to do is a show you a little bit about that and show you how Sesame Street, uh, the overall effect, compared to some of these interventions. All right. So here's the picture. And I know it doesn't look uh, wildly attractive, necessarily, but I want to talk through it. Um, so here's an example of Olivia. Um, and this bar here, the bigger the bar, the indication of how big an effect there was on uh, cognitive outcomes, how much kids knew in terms of letters and numbers, uh, how much, uh, how high they scored on the IQ tests, for example. And so each of these uh, are representing the effect of some intervention. Okay, make sense? And the color of the bar uh, indicates what the type of intervention was. So if it's a white bar, it was the effect of giving food supplements. If it's a gray bar, like over here, it's the effect of giving parents cash. So in Ecuador, they were studying low-income families and studied the effects of giving parents money on children's learning outcomes. And if they were dark gray bars, like this one here in Turkey, uh, they were looking at the effects of children being enrolled in preschool uh, and, and receiving food as well. Um, and so you can see that there's a huge range um, some interventions had very little effect, and some interventions were incredibly uh, effective, like this one at the bottom in the Philippines. Um, um, and that there's a lot of variability in there. And what I've done is I've superimposed two lines, right? There's this red line, uh, which is kind of what the overall effect was of watching Stephen Street across all the outcomes, um, both cognitive, pro-social attitudes, and sort of learning about the world. You can see that Sesame Street, sort of watching Sesame Street, had an effect that was kind of bigger than the number of them and comparable to a number of other preschool interventions. And then when we look specifically at this blue line, which is the sort of superimposed uh, line of the overall effect on cognitive outcomes, letters, numbers, um, shapes, and so on, which is most comparable to what was being studied in this meta-analysis here. Um, um, you can see, again, that the effect of watching Sesame Street overall across all those studies was, again, bigger than a number of others and comparable to many. Now, clearly, you know, there are some here that have substantially bigger effects, but that's not surprising given that these were interventions where the kids actually went to preschool, often for um, multiple hours a day, multiple days a week, for several years, and we're talking about the effects of um, sort of the very intensive, labor-intensive, resource-intensive interventions. Um, so this is where the Sesame Street uh, fell on cognitive outcomes. So last slide from me. Uh, we concluded that, obviously, uh, there is no substitute for in-person intensive preschool education. Uh, and no one would have imagined that there really would be. 
start uh, watching Sesame Street even in very low income or uh, areas or in areas that had um, had considerable uh, social unrest. Um, uh, was associated with a number of positive outcomes. It was associated with learning basic skills like numeracy, literacy, sorting, colors, uh, shapes, and so on. It was associated with learning about the world around them. But often important health things like wearing uh, a, a helmet or washing one's hands um, or learning about one's own culture, the naming uh, of country, the certain musical instruments, holidays, learning about science and the environment. Um, and then to a lesser degree but still significantly, watching Sesame Street was also associated with more pro-social attitudes towards gender, towards different religious groups, uh, or different ethnic outcomes. Okay, so I am going to stop here. Um, and I see that Gail is going to moderate and leave the question and answers. I just want to point out that I would be delighted to take questions, even if they come later. So here's my email address. Um, and you can contact me. And June's got hers here too. Okay? And I'm going to stop there. Any questions for us? Anyone have any questions? Uh, I, I noticed um, somebody had a question about the story pond from earlier. Yes. It was yeah, someone wanted to know if they could possibly use it in the preschool. Is that something that's available to you? Um, it is. I believe that was William, right? Um, it, it is something that we can share. Oh, hi, Anne. <laughs> um, it is something that we can share. Um, the the thing about the story pond, it's 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 a it's a big mat, so it's a little bit unwieldy, um, and it's also and, and we don't have it, it, we don't have extra copies. We can certainly send you um, electronic versions, and and maybe we can connect later. Oh, you you needed to know how. It, okay, you need to know how to do it. Um, so just to answer Anne's question first, um, it's basically a big vinyl mat um, with a bunch of icons on it. And um, the idea is that um, th you, you can play the game in different ways. The icons are represent things in children's everyday lives from um, you know, people around them, you know, family to different landscapes, nature, um, food, things like that. Things that children are familiar with. Um, so one of the things we do with the story pawn is have ch uh, one child jump on one, what we call a stone. Um, that's what the icons look like. It's like it's a stone on a pond. And then they would start telling a story. So let's say they jump on a, story, uh, a picture of a monkey. They would say, you know, one day I was walking on the street and I saw a monkey. And then we'll have the other ch another child in the class jump on another stone and then continue the story from there. And then another child would join in and another child would join in. So this is a, it ends up being a very fun sort of participatory um, activity. And kids really like it. And it kind of teaches them storytelling and narrative skills. You know, it teaches them that the story has a beginning, a middle, and end. It has characters. Um, so kids really like it. Another thing that we can, we do with a story pond is, is to build vocabulary around the icons. Um, we also use it to kind of teach classification skills because the icons are scattered throughout um, the vinyl mat. So you know you could have kids say, you know, everyone jump on an animal, then everybody has to find an animal to jump on. Yeah. So and kids co totally could make a story pond, um, and you can you can and and you don't have to have a vinyl mat. I think the idea is if you can even do a printout of icons and just scatter them on the ground, so you don't have to have you know a fancy you know uh, a p piece of material. It's, it's something that um, I think could be adapted and, and made simple and you know more portable. Does that make sense? Great. Me. Okay. And William had a question about Peru. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. So I so I don't have any data about that. Do, um, do, yeah. do you know if there's any summative 
I no, I, I don't believe we have a co-production in Peru. Um, if we did, it was probably before my time. Um, I don't think we, we did, though. Um, so I don't think we've ever done a summative evaluation of Sesame, Sesame Street's impact in Peru. Hmm. Um, workshop and yes, um, uh, yes. The short answer is yes, Nate. To your question about um, cell phones and the workshop, um, I think we've sort of experimented at the workshop in, in different different ways to use the cell phone uh, uh, with you know education and young children. Um, in the United States, we had done a small pilot study of. Um, putting um, a, a sort of educational tips for parents on a cell phone. Um, so let's say, you know, we would say we would have a tip for a parent if you're at a grocery store, you know, point out, you know, all the things that start with the letter C. The letter of the day is the letter C. So we would have, um, you know, a letter of the day and we'd have supporting um, ideas and tips for parents to um, facilitate, you know, um, the communication and the teaching with their child. So that was more um, parent-targeted content um, because I think cell phones, this was an older study, so cell phones at the time were, they were not smartphones. They were the smaller cell phones that weren't, weren't really, um, you know, very usable for a preschool age child. Um, so we targeted the content of parents. Um, more recently, um, I think we've done um, work in India around um, radio content um, through cell phones. Um, that's not terribly, um, common in the United States, but it's, it's pretty common in India. So we've created um, radio episodes around health, hygiene, and nutrition, and making that available through a radio network. And um, people can listen to it through their cell phone and, um, and uh, you know, call in or, or, or download content. And um, other cell phone initiatives we've done, um, you know, we've worked with, um, we've, we've had sort of informal conversations with um, folks like Carnegie Mellon who are doing a lot of gaming um, on cell phones um, in India and Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. So we've also kind of thought about gaming as well. Um, but in, I think for a lot of, a lot of countries, the cell phone, um, cell phones that are available are not very high-end cell phones. So in terms of the interface and the button pressing, I think that still proves a little bit challenging for our, our audience. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I think we, um, I think we're still exploring that. Um, but I think the, the the sort of the older cell phones um, still prove a little bit hard to, for like small for small fingers to to navigate and to use. So. Yeah, you're welcome, Nate. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, I was thinking too, as I was describing um, Anne about the cell phones, I was thinking of iPads too. And we're certainly um, developing apps um, for the iPad. Um, I think we've launched a few. And I think that's definitely going to be an ongoing, um, an ongoing effort uh, at the company to continue to develop educational games and, and apps on iPads, because kids just uh, really take to it, and it's so intuitive, and the interface is so simple for them, you know, as opposed to a cell phone. So, yeah, <laughs> I think there are some apps that are available. I'll I'll let you know. We should exchange contact information, and you have my email. It's on the screen. Yes, absolutely. Uh, everyone, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm available, happy to talk. Um, Nate, are you asking about the story pond material or story creation in general? Okay. Um, the story pond, um, I believe we, well, we've adapted the story plan for use in several countries around the world. Um, and right now, I think we're, st we're, well, I mean, we're starting an, um, an evaluation of a project in, in Indonesia that uses the story pond. And we're hoping to build in some evaluation of whether it, it does impact children's narrative skills 
at all. Um, it's a little bit tricky because it's a little bit hard to measure narrative skills in a very reliable way among young children, um, but we're trying to do that. Are they on a website, the reality games? Yeah. I see. Yeah, let us, we would love to see that website. Is it, Nate, um, does your tar is, what age is your target audience? the games that you create. OK. OK. Middle school. Anyone would like the mic, if they would raise their hand, that's the third button over underneath the name at the top, and then I can give you the mic. Great. I'm glad you found this helpful. Um, I'm happy to definitely have follow-up conversations. Any other questions? Thank you so much, June, and we really appreciate you coming, and Louise, thank you so much for coming, especially in the Netherlands. What time is it in the Netherlands right now, oh, actually? I'm curious. It's not so bad at all. It's like five minutes to four in the afternoon, so it's not a problem. It's a joy to be here. It's great, and, and hopefully we can get you more involved next year, too. We'd love to keep hearing updates of what you're doing, because I think, you know, at least in the U.S., I think people are really not necessarily aware of the work that's going on and that you're impacting not just U.S. children, but children all over the world. Yeah. And um, it's a great legacy, and, and we're, we're very excited to hear what you have to say. This session is going to be um, is recorded, and everybody can go to globaleducationconference.com, and there is a quick links page. And once we stop recording, it will take about a half hour for the recording to process. So it will be available for posterity. Um, after that, and you can, uh, it's very interesting how people are using the recordings. People who can't get here because of time differences are able to view things, but also people are using this information for graduate school classes and, and all sorts of things. It's, people are being very creative in how they're, they're accessing the archived um, information. So I want to thank June and Louise particularly because this is their first time presenting virtually and they did a wonderful job, beautiful slides, beautiful information, and uh, you were fabulous. So, thank you. Um, thank I'm going you. to stop recording in a few minutes. If you want to ask a few more questions, we can still do that. We've got time. Um, but I just want to make sure that I thanked you um, before we, we ended. Great. Thanks. Thanks for having Great. us. It was really fun. Uh, is there something from Gabinda? I I finished um, the little hand icon. Yeah, I see a few text messages going back. The yeah. chat messages going yeah, back and I forth. Yeah, I know that. We, yeah, we were talking but about. I'm um, not yeah. sure if it's with just Nate or if it's Gabinda a broader from question. Nepal, and I did uh -huh. give him. Um, Audio, priv uh, audio privileges. So, Govinda, if you want to say something, you're more than welcome to.
looks like they're having band issues, um, so Govinda might not be able to talk. Yeah, I think she was saying that um, the connectivity was a little yeah. problematic. Yeah. Uh, Govinda has been on every session I think I've been to at the conference. He, uh, <laughs> he's eating this up, so uh, there he is. Oh, great. Okay, there's his question. Okay. Um, Govinda, I, I don't have a link for that, for the story pond, but um, if you could send me an email, I can follow up and we can communicate about it. Is that all right? I'm not sure if you can hear, actually. Yeah. I'll, I'll type them. I'm trying to write down everyone's emails. Save you some time. This is a nice little trick. Um, you can save the chat conversation, uh -huh. which uh -huh. I don't think is normally part of the archive um, when this is recorded. Um, okay. you, you can see the chat, but you can't save it from the recording. So you might want to do this now. It's kind of a fun thing. If you go to the file menu, uh -huh. and everybody can do this, I believe and go to Save, uh -huh. and then Chat, you can uh -huh. save a text file, um, a okay. plain text file of Great. the conversation. It will have any of the links or email addresses that were put into the chat. OK, great. Perfect. All right, you guys. I'm going to log off. Great. It was fun to do. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Okay, bye, June. Bye. Bye. bye.